This is Alvin. It opens the church. Now man can explore the ocean to the very outer edge of the continental shelf and beyond. The Office of Naval Research provided inspiration and funds for the development of this scientific tool which will extend man's first-hand knowledge of the depths of the ocean. This diagram shows the general arrangement of the components. The propulsion equipment is housed in the after section of what is called the superstructure. Included here are the buoyancy spheres which control the vertical movement. Here too are the mercury trim tanks. Transferring mercury from one tank to another controls the attitude up to a 30 degree angle. This equipment section is free flooded. Seawater is allowed to run around the small tanks the lines, and the waterproof equipment boxes. Thus, the structure does not have to withstand the extreme pressure of the ocean depths. Mounted on the forward portion of Alvin is an arm with a mechanical hand to pick up specimens from the ocean floor. Underwater cameras can also be mounted here. A large steel ball is located in the forward section. This is the pressure hull. In it, three men can accomplish research studies at a 6,000-foot depth, while the atmosphere within is equivalent to that of your own home. The seven-foot steel sphere is of heavy wall construction so that it will not collapse when subjected to the pressure of over 3,000 pounds per square inch. In order to construct the pressure hull, which has a finished wall thickness of one and one-third inches, a special high-strength steel sheet is cut in a circular blank. From this, steel hemispheres will be spun. After the steel blanks are heated in a furnace to the proper working temperature, they are moved to the spinning machine, which rolls the flat sheet into a hemisphere in a series of operations. The precise control of the rolls forms the sheet with a very high degree of accuracy. During this process, the steel gradually cools down and must be reheated to maintain proper working temperature. The rolling of the steel into the hemispherical shape requires a great deal of skill to produce a uniform thickness, maintain a precise shape and avoid the development of stresses or defects in the material. After the spinning of the hemispheres has been completed, they are rough ground. Then they are tested to ensure that no defects or flaws exist which could cause failure of the hull at great depths. After testing, the interior and the edges of the hemispheres are machined and welded to form the full sphere. Holes are cut for the windows and hatch, and the weld is offset from these holes. The hull is machined to a final finish to guard against any irregularities in the surface which could introduce stress points and cause hull failure. The finished hull is equipped with a hatch and thick tapered plexiglass windows for viewing ports. Around the central window, electrical leads pass from the inside of the hull to the outside to provide for instrumentation and control functions. Around the spherical pressure hull, a fiberglass superstructure or fairing is constructed to contain the mechanical equipment and to give streamlining. A conning tower is provided to prevent water splashing into the hull from wave action while surfaced. 
The superstructure parts are formed from fiberglass and plastic. They are laid up over these molds. There must be a high ratio of strong glass fibers in the polyester plastic. The sections are bolted together over a metal framework to withstand the impact of objects and to allow the submarine to rest on the ocean floor. After fabrication and finishing of the component parts, the final structure is assembled around the metal framework. The various components, such as the hydraulic main propulsion unit, the ballast and trim tanks, and the various controls are all assembled together in the superstructure. The spherical pressure hull is fitted in place. Then, the fairing and conning tower are assembled over the pressure hull. Next, the lift propeller units are installed. Now the main propulsion unit is added. Finally, the assembled Alvin is ready for testing. Alvin was dedicated in ceremonies at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute at Woods Hole, Massachusetts in June 1964. Alvin proved to be very stable in the water with its seven and a half foot draft. Now we are ready for extensive tests of the first vehicle of this kind ever built. Many new concepts are embodied in the design of Alvin and we must determine if the vessel will perform according to predictions of scientists and engineers who contributed to its design. Here we see a test of hull separation. This is a design feature which returns the occupants safely to the surface in the event of accident or malfunction. Another safety feature of Alvin is that each of the three batteries can be dropped to reduce the weight of the vehicle. These batteries are installed in a battery rack in the lower rear section of the vehicle, so they can be easily... The underwater tests include the evaluation of the propulsion units, studies of the performance of the steering mechanism, determination of the maneuverability, range, and duration of operation. Finally, on July 20th, 1965, Alvin successfully made a record-breaking dive to the depth of 6,000 feet near New Providence Island in the Bahamas. Alvin is capable of limited independent operation. However, a catamaran was built from surplus Navy floats to act as a mother vessel so that the submarine can be lifted out of the water to recharge its batteries and replenish its air supply. The catamaran has a machine shop, an electrical repair shop, and housing for the surface crews. Although it is usually towed over long distances, the catamaran is capable of traveling on its own in a local area. As the research scientist boards Alvin, we see preparation for embarkation on a research mission. Here we notice that the mechanical arm has been replaced with a movable camera rack for a photographic study. The scuba divers are not part of the crew, but are used in the launch operation to assure that no damage is incurred from the bobbing of Alvin as it backs out of the cradle on the catamaran and gets underway on its own. As Alvin prepares to dive, the operations crew on the catamaran maintains communications 
and keeps a constant check on the progress of Alvin during its trip into the depths of the sea. Inside, the Alvin crew maintains contact with the surface and is provided with complete instrumentation for the operation of the submarine and with scientific research instruments necessary for each particular research project. Now we dive to our goal. You can see the lift propellers which are used for maneuverability as Alvin proceeds deeper and deeper into the sea. The scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute can now measure temperatures, study current flows, record geological information, and see firsthand biological life in the deep ocean. With the mechanical arm, the scientists can probe in the mud and muck, extract specimens from their hiding places, and bring them to the viewing port. The small control box held by the operator lets him look at his selected specimens from every angle. A sonar system extends underwater visibility and gives visual indication of objects ahead to the operator. A camera drive system permits the operator to move the cameras in every direction to perform scientific photography, including a television monitor for direct underwater images. Returning from the depths, the research crew is not concerned with decompression delays, which would normally slow the ascent of divers who must adjust to changes in pressure. As we load Alvin on the catamaran, another mission has been completed by this newest of research submarines. Alvin may have cruised 15 or 20 miles, ranging over the floor of the ocean at speeds of two to three knots for as long as 24 hours. Alvin is the culmination of the efforts of the Office of Naval Research and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and provides a dramatic new research tool for the increasingly important and vital field of oceanography.